Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Star Trek Critic. So, what is the Star Trek Critic? We have all seen the show several times over, and after a while you've noticed little errors in the episodes that sometimes don't quite make sense. And after a while you feel like if you handed this episode in as an English project or a film project, it would be thrown back at you because of all the things you miss. Things like plot holes, continuity errors, grammar, costume mismatches, and of course just not standing up to the test of time. All episodes start with a score of 100, then lose one point for each error. Although sometimes one error can be more noticeable than others, and you might feel the need to take away more points, but it will always be just one point. Now unfortunately, this video will all be still photos. The Star Trek owners are very protective of their copyright, so you'll notice the photos aren't the best quality or might be in the corner or something. Sharing this information is a hobby of mine, and I think you would rather see a blurry photo of what I'm talking about instead of just looking at my face for 15 minutes. And then after this, you can watch the actual episode. The first episode is The Cage, the unaired pilot which was rejected, but if it wasn't for The Cage, there wouldn't be any Star Trek at all. This is an excellent first shot of the USS Enterprise, and the only time they look through the top of the ship into the bridge, although the outside footage is reused frequently. Here is where they lose their first point for portraying diversity in the future with an all-white cast. The opening theme music is the same music as in the original series. The Telosians use their power of illusion to lure the Enterprise to Talos IV to get a human male to help repopulate the surface of their planet. The radio waves are traveling at light speed. Look closely, Tyler's arm is bandaged all the way through the show. There is great attention to detail here. Number one, played by Majel Barrett, is the first officer. The same executives that complained about the all-white cast strangely rejected the idea of a female first officer, so the executives lose a point. Captain Pike obviously doesn't want that report. They determined that a stress call is coming from Talos 4, where the USS Columbia crashed 18 years ago. Since the radio waves are traveling at light speed, this places Talos 4 as 18 light years away. The first mention of a Class M planet being Earth-type. Number one and Spock both seem surprised that Captain Pike says there isn't enough evidence to go investigate, but how long would it take to get there? So what is warp speed? As seen in these images, the nacelles create a warp bubble around the ship that folds space and the ship slides through from point A to point B at speeds faster than light. How fast is warp speed? Rumors say Gene Roddenberry originally wanted the Enterprise to travel at 6,000 times the speed of light, a ridiculously high number, making this trip take 13 and a half hours. The original series kept it simple. Warp speed is the cube of the number times the speed of light. Warp 1 is 1 times the speed, all the way up to warp 10, which is 1,000. Look closely. Warp 7 is almost the same speed as traveling 1 light year per day, making it very easy to calculate. Since Talos 4 is 18 light years away, it will take 18 days to get there. The later series used a different scale called the Okuda scale, and at warp 7 it would take about 9 days. But this is taking too long, so simply put, the writers lose a point for not saying how long it will take. Look closely, the turbo lift is just an aluminum can, no detail in there at all. You rarely see off-duty crew in off-duty clothes. Looks like they're going to the tennis court. Captain Pike has the first flip phone. Check out the detail here. You see a captain's hat, which you will never see again. A beautiful three-sided TV set, which takes up way too much space on a ship. They should have had a flat screen TV. And Pike loses a point here for leaving a phaser out in the open for anyone to pick up. This is not gun safety at all. And why is his bed so short? Now look, here comes the doctor. He walks in without knocking. He could have just grabbed that phaser. You never know. The Doctor of the Future learns about his patients by getting them drunk. Here Pike mentions two dead and seven injured from the fight on Rigel 7, and three crewmen are shown with injuries. The rest of their conversation is foreshadowing not only of the fantasies he is going to encounter with Vina, but also to the network of what other types of episodes Star Trek consist of, but uh, they weren't really noticing that. This simply tells the viewer how many people are on the ship. It would be nice if they just to simply explained how fast warp speed is. Captain Pike makes a similar speech to Vina when they are in the park. This product of the future is here today. It is called Video Chat. 
the new message doesn't say much more. The information is still 18 years old. They could have starved to death. Look closely. She doesn't have a speaking part, but there is a woman on the bridge. Listen closely to what Captain Pike says later. So, two vague pieces of information convince Captain Pike to investigate, and they're going to travel at Time Warp Factor 7. How long that takes is never explained, but as far as this episode is concerned, it isn't nearly 9 or 18 days. Pike says engage just like Picard. This special effect demonstrating warp travel is only used in the cage. Tyler confirms they are traveling warp 7 by holding up 7 fingers. Yeoman Colt walks in, played by Laurel Goodwin. She is the last surviving actor of the crew. Pike slams right into her and then makes some unusual comments. This quick look at the blue shirt adds a lot of depth to the characters. Colt is still on the bridge, right behind Pike. Not only does Pike insult his first officer, but he doesn't realize there are actually three women on the bridge, so he loses a point. If you look closely at Talos IV, that is actually North America, covered in clouds. Look closely at the geologist coming in, he has a bandage on his neck. Another one of the injured crew, Spock is the third. Pike loses another point here. Both Tyler and Spock are injured, but he asks them to go on the landing party and leaves number one on the ship. Spock should have stayed in command while number one went down instead. Which is why this comment's kind of uh, insulting. Look fast, Spock has a bandage on his left ankle. The landing party has overcoats and equipment. The transporter chief is wearing glasses while he's writing something down. Landing party equipment was never in the budget in the other series. Spock is limping because he is injured. Maybe he should have stayed on the bridge while number one being down instead. Spock loses a point for smiling at a singing plant, which breaks continuity in the Trek universe. Uh, according to IMDb, the survivor on the left is Leonard Moody. He was the oldest Trek actor, born in 1883. Dr. Haskin is, is played by John Lormer, who has been on everything, including two other Trek episodes. And we still don't really know what he means by the time barrier being broken. The survivors are all dressed in rags, but Vina is dressed like she's on a tropical island. This is the first few of the Telosians, where this show gets labeled as being too cerebral. The network is constantly thinking about ratings, and having your first enemy as people with giant brains isn't going to bring in the viewers, so they lose a point for not being scary enough. Pike loses a point for talking to the sky instead of into the communicator. Boyce is concerned that their health is too good, it's a red flag. The scene of the Telosians abducting Pike isn't enough to sell to the network. Here is proof the Telosians are really good at illusions. They keep blasting at the rock, and to the left of the door, a waterfall keeps going. It would turn into steam from the heat if it wasn't an illusion. Spock has to report that he lost the captain. Number one is thinking that wouldn't have happened if she was on the away team. Now this ape creature turns into a bird. The very first episode of Star Trek, and they have a shape-shifting creature, but every time they come upon a shapeshifter, they act like they've never seen one before. Captain Pike was the first one to see one. And there he goes, he turns from an ape to a bird. To make the hallway look longer, this Telosian is played by Felix Silla, who also played Cousin It on The Addams Family. Pike says he is from the other end of the galaxy. Science fiction shows always have a problem with time and distance. Which is, ironically, what all science fiction shows are about. Pike says he can read their minds, but he can't. He's really just threatening them. Minus one point, since this planet isn't the same one they were orbiting earlier. The Doctor warns them of how dangerous the illusions are. Number one asks why he might be abducted. Spock's answer is no help at all. And his buzzing about comment isn't too far-fetched. It's just unusual for Spock. Can Captain Pike feel them probing his mind? That would probably drive him crazy. What the network's missed is that these three fantasies he lives through with Vina are called webisodes today. Brief snippets of what the actual series would be. The battle on Rigel 7 is the action-adventure webisode. The picnic is the romance future Earth webisode. And the Orion webisode shows how racy they can get. So the cage is really four episodes rolled into one. But the networks didn't bite. Now this is a bad wink. 
before Vina, she's had to play act for the Telosians her whole life. Captain Pike still thinks she's an illusion. She does have a sense of humor. Number one also loses a point for talking to the sky instead of into the communicator. Only Spock talked into the communicator. I guess he thought that was a logical thing to do. The special effects are pretty good considering the tight budget. At the end, the waterfall is still tumbling off the rock after being blasted away. So the illusion is holding pretty strong, just the way the doctor told it it would. Vina tells the backstory of the Telosians. There is no explanation of how she learned about Adam and Eve. Then she gets punished for letting Pike know about his keepers. Then Vina disappears, but not her dress. He's thinking, hey, somewhere around here, she's naked. Can anyone tell me what childhood fable this is from that Captain Pike is experiencing? Because I don't know what it's from. Pike learns a secret weapon. The Keeper gets snotty, getting even for being scared. The second webisode takes place on a future Earth with live horses. Vina mentions her headaches. Is she referring to the Pelosians' punishment or just being an Earth woman? We will never know. And I don't ever want to eat chicken tuna at the same time, please. I do not want that sandwich. Here's where Captain Pike uh, recites a similar speech that uh, the doctor gave him while he was in his uh, quarters. Pike makes a grammatical error. He says, does that block off our mind from them? Our is plural, mind is singular. It should be our mind. That's just the English major me coming out. That's what she said. According to what Vina says here, the Telosians probed her idea of the Dream Man and found Captain Pike 18 light years away. She could be making that up though. This is the third webisode, Captain Pike as an Orion slave trader. Coming up next is the biggest mistake of the episode. Definitely loses a point for being inappropriate and not standing the test of time. The line actually like being taken advantage of. They changed the line in the menagerie because it was so bad. Captain Pike has to run off and take a cold shower. The geologist asks a legitimate question, can the cavern be an illusion too? And Spock takes credit for it. And you can see they still have bandages on. I love Spock's comment. They were probably given the illusion that they were beaming them all down too. The Telosians made sure they were beamed down inside Captain Pike's cage. They need to be careful here, it's just an illusion that they don't work. Three Earth women bickering just shows that after 300 years, some things stay the same. Number one proves she's just as good at it. Avina must be really pissed right now. She's been alone for 18 years, and they brought Captain Pike for her. But since it wasn't working, they simply brought in number one in cult. One thing about the Telosians, they are monogamous. And stay, instead of saying he can have all three, they say he can only choose one. Is Vina in the cage with them, or is it just an image of her, since she doesn't look like that in real life? And here Spock loses a point. The captain, first officer, and yeoman who just replaced the one who was killed have all been abducted, and his response is, we're leaving. What happened to leave no one behind? Maybe he secretly wanted command all this time. And he's not saying get the ship a safe distance, he really means saying they're leaving completely, but the Telosians have stopped them. Did Pike leave the phaser so close to that door on accident or on purpose to lure the Keeper? I think it was done on purpose. The photos in the ship's library are pretty archaic. This goes back to Spock's earlier reference to buzzing about. Here the water is gone, it was just an illusion too. In the 1970s, this was one of the Star Trek playsets Skits could buy, even though it really had nothing to do with the regular series. It was the, for the menagerie, really. The Keeper is making that up, he's just saying that since they got the best of them. And he still says Pike can only choose one female. Why can't he have all three? Here it's actually a plot point so Pike can make a deal with the Keeper. He will stay if they let the two go back to the Enterprise. The Keeper tries to say they're going to be happy artisans. Look at number one's nails quickly as she sets the phaser on overload. Then look at Colt's expression, she's saying I didn't sign up for this. And then uh, number one says she's going to blow everybody up. This could be a bluff if they're encouraging the Keeper to go underground away from the blast. Vina chooses to stay inside the blast. So why do these Telosians have to come out the elevator to communicate with the Keeper? The only reason is so that they'd have a reason for number one to turn off the phaser. 
the Telosians lose a point for being so slow to figure that one out. Here, Captain Pike says you captured one of us, but in reality they captured three. The Telosians lose another point. They say the humans can go, Venus says they can go, Pike tries diplomacy and talks trade, but the Keeper says humans could learn their power of illusion and that would be too dangerous, but they would learn that in captivity as well. Vina has been fidgeting this whole time about going with them. Watch Spock and the crewmen when the transporter comes back on, they have to stand like 10 feet away from it. Unfortunately, Susan Oliver was a heavy smoker and died at the age of only 58. Now, Jeffrey Hunter wasn't interested in science fiction and pursued movies instead, but he suffered a series of strokes and died when he was only 42 in 1969. This is proof that Telosians have lost all their technical skills. They didn't even look in the Columbia's medical books to help uh, put it back together. Now Vina has her own illusion to play house with, but he's not real. This little clip is rescued from the menagerie. You can see part of the screen there that they were watching. Captain Pike loses one more point for agreeing with Vina and staying behind because body acceptance is an important issue today, so it should still be a big issue 300 years from now, and she should be welcome on the Enterprise. Right when they come through the door, number one hands her jacket to somebody. Captain Pike bumps into Colt one more time. She hands him his clipboard and pen, and the cage ends on a funny note. And we will never know the answer. The Starship Enterprise flies off into the sunset with Captain Pike and crew in their one and only episode. Although without it, there would be no Star Trek as we know it. The crew is featured in various books and fan fiction, and Captain Mike Pike makes a return in the recent movies and TV show, so they do have their own generation of a five-year mission. Can you imagine this crew waiting to see if the pilot gets picked up, and then two years later seeing it on TV and then saying, hey, that isn't us. And unfortunately, they didn't take a group photo, or at least there are none that I can find, and this is about as close as you can get, so I put a few uh, stills after this. And goodbye to Talos 4. And the cage graded gets a score of 85. Thank you for viewing my first critic video. I now have 738 more episodes to evaluate. Please leave your comments below. Specifically, do you think number one was bluffing when she put the phaser on overload? And should Vina have gone with the Enterprise, considering their medical technology could have helped her out? And is staying behind because of her looks now an outdated concept? Post any Captain Pike era novels you think others would enjoy. Check out my poll. If this version of Star Trek was picked up for series, how many seasons do you think it would have lasted? Any feedback on making these videos better will be appreciated. Please share this video with someone who may be interested, and check out my other videos in the playlist column, and click that subscribe button, and I will see you again real soon.